Well, uh, welcome all of you, and let me say it's uh, an honor to be here, and especially to, to be here with our two very distinguished ambassadors. I'm Ed Royce, former chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and let me say that Indian Ambassador to the United States, Harsh Vardhan Shringla, has served in postings from France to the UN to Vietnam, Israel, and South Africa. He has published papers on conflict prevention and on economic diplomacy, and many of you heard his words in Houston last week when he said, India's success relies on ensuring that there is a greater interest and involvement of American industries and businesses in the country. U.S. Ambassador to India, Kenneth Juster, brings a similar focus to the relationship between India and the United States. He previously served as the Deputy Assistant to the President for International Economic Affairs, and Ambassador Juster also served as our Under Secretary of Commerce in charge of the Bureau of Industry and Security. He co-founded and served as the U.S. Chair of the U.S. India High Technology Cooperative Group, Cooperation Group, and he was also one of the key architects of the Next Steps in Strategic Partnership Initiative between the United States and India. So I'll turn to M Ambassador Shringla first uh, for your opening observations, any comments that you would like to make here at the India Ideas Summit, and then we'll go to Ambassador Jasper. Well, uh, good morning, and uh, let me start by um, pointing out that uh, we're very grateful that you, Congressman Ed Royce, is uh, moderating this session. There could not be, have been a better person to do that. We know that as the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of, the, of Congress, of the House, uh, you were instrumental in, in pushing through the India-US Civil Nuclear Agreement, uh, which we know was uh, seminal in bringing us to our current state of relations, which is uh, probably uh, as uh, strong and as uh, good a relationship as we've had in, in all the years since India attained independence. Uh, and uh, to come to your uh, question, of course, uh, I think this is a very, very important time. Uh, we have just seen uh, the re-election of Prime Minister Modi with a clear and unambiguous mandate. The people of India voted strategically to give him every uh, possible uh, opportunity to fulfill the aspirations for a strong, stable, uh, economically uh, forward-moving uh, country. And uh, in that context, I quote Prime Minister Modi when he says that he considers the U.S. to be a primary partner in, the, in achieving the socio-economic transformation of the country through flagship schemes and programs. And, uh, and of course, uh, in that context, I think the uh, involvement of uh, U.S. industry in terms of investments, in terms of uh, technology transfers, in terms of greater trade is, is critical uh, to uh, not just the growth and development of India and the meeting of our objectives, but I think uh, in terms of uh, a mutuality of benefit uh, in, in, in fostering greater trade, greater cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Jester. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman. And let me reiterate what Ambassador Shrinkler said about your tremendous role in the U.S.-India relationship. I appreciate it enormously, and it's a great honor to be on the same stage with you and with Ambassador Shrinkler. I also want to thank the U.S.-India Business Council for all the outstanding work you have done in advance in the relationship. Nisha Biswal has been a real uh, tremendous leader of the organization, uh, Ambika Sharma uh, in India as well. And we certainly at the embassy appreciate the efforts that they make in working with them. Uh, I've been very fortunate to work on U.S.-India relations in one capacity or another as a government official, as a technology executive, as a person involved in uh, international finance and investment and now as ambassador for the last 20 years. And if you look at the transformation that's occurred, it truly is remarkable. Uh, we work together across a rich range of issues, obviously defense and security, counterterrorism, economic issues, uh, but also energy, aviation, trade, uh, uh, health, education, uh, uh, the environment, oceans, uh, space, uh, a wide range of uh, interactions. And from my perspective, as the world in Asia and more broadly is undergoing enormous change, uh, we see a rising China, we see shifting power alignments, 
the U.S.-India relationship really can be a anchor for the international order and for the Indo-Pacific for the years to come. And working together with other like-minded countries, I think we can create a region where there is not just freedom of action and uh, independent liberty of individuals, but also navigation, freedom of overflight, uh, there'll be economic development without predatory practices, uh, there'll be the rule of law, law-based, uh, rules-based order, uh, and I think that this is really where our partnership can make a huge difference. Uh, the only other point I'd add before we go on to the questions is that a lot of the focus over the years has been on the defense and security relationship. Uh, the economic relationship has grown from when I first began uh, in 2001, bilateral trade was about 21 billion to today it's over 140 billion. But I think there's enormous untapped potential and we need to start thinking of the economic relationship in the same strategic way we think about the defense and security relationship. So maybe, Ambassador, we should talk specifically about the, the full potential of that economic relationship. As you said, uh, Yes, we've made headway, but, but clearly there's so much more that is possible here, and yet there are challenges to achieving that full potential. Ambassador, would you like to discuss maybe the full potential in terms of that vision, and yet also the challenges that have to be faced in order to achieve it? Well, uh, the potentials are, um, I think, um, Many of them are well known. I mean, we are a large economy. Uh, we, as of now, we are the seventh largest economy in the world. But five years ago, when Prime Minister Modi was elected uh, for the first term, uh, we were the 11th largest economy in the world. And this year, we expect to become the fifth largest economy in the world. So um, in terms of an economy, we are one of the larger economies. We are a fast-growing economy. We have achieved over 7% growth over the last 20 years. And uh, we have uh, a very clear ambition to become a $5 trillion economy by the year 2025, and a $10 trillion economy 10 years after that, eight years after that. So in that sense, uh, economic growth and uh, the size of the economy is important. It's also the size of the market because, of, because we are a population of 1.3 billion. But what is important is that we are a young country. We are, a, in demographic terms, uh, by the year 2022, the average age in India will be 28.2 years. So from that perspective, we will, be, uh, we will have the highest productive world workforce in the world. Uh, and we would also, I think, uh, be one of the unique countries which are large, with a large workforce and a smaller aging population to support. Uh, but it also means in sheer market terms that uh, we, have, we will have uh, a young population with uh, an aspiring population with greater purchasing power. And I think that is important as our standard of living increases, the per capita income increases the size of the uh, market and, and uh, the demographic profile of the market is also very important to keep in mind. And along with that profile comes the fact that we produce, as someone yesterday said, we produce a large number of trained workforce, uh, a million engineers every year uh, is churned out by our educational system. There's a lot of value attached to education in India. We have a very large English-speaking population. And uh, as I said, a young uh, population with the skills needed uh, to cope up with the requirements of uh, the uh, manufacturing and other sectors, service sectors of the 21st century. So uh, from that sense, I think the potentials uh, of India are very significant. Uh, what is also important is that we are in a neighborhood which is also uh, a growing neighborhood, um, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, and uh, the neighboring states represent uh, a very fast growing, uh, one of the fastest growing regions of the world. So when we talk about the Indo-Pacific region, it is clearly a region of great growth and potential. And India is well placed as a hub to, to cater to the requirements of these countries. Uh, before coming here, I was a master in Thailand and Bangladesh. And in both these countries, I've seen a tremendous increase in demand. At the same time, uh, a great acceptance and compatibility for Indian goods and, and services. And when you look at that, then India becomes a hub for servicing the entire region. And this is something that was, would be a great advantage to those who are looking uh, towards India in terms of investments and technology transfers. But what is more important is that the policy framework uh, for an environment conducive for investments has been laid by Prime Minister Modi. Uh, in the last year or two, we have jumped 40 places to come to 77 position in the World Bank's ease of doing business. 
Now that's not, that's not an insignificant uh, you know, development because it means that we have made the necessary policy and regulatory decisions that would make investments easier and faster. 90% of foreign direct investments in India are through the direct, through the automatic route, which means you don't need to uh, go through the government approval process. It is online and you get the approvals. And of course, uh, at the same time, I think, uh, you know, a significant amount of the red tape has been cut. Uh, one of the first decisions that the government of Prime Minister Modi took in the 2.0 term, the second term, uh, is uh, to invest massively in infrastructure development. We've decided to double the number of highways uh, in India to 200,000 kilometers, uh, invest about $1.4 trillion in infrastructure development. The demand in India and, and the growth that is projected through this will not be met only by government resources. We are looking for private sector investments. Someone yesterday, I think it's a gentleman from, uh, from Vision 18 mentioned that we are looking at a rate of 12% growth in manufacturing terms. Our requirement is about 8%, so we need that extra 4%. And that for that 4%, to come in, we will need significant investments uh, from, uh, from both within and outside. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at, uh, at, at drawing capital in in a, ma in a manner that is uh, hugely beneficial. Also keep in mind that one third of the total energy requirements in the world will be consumed by India. So we are an energy dependent country, we are looking for energy and in that context the scope for investments in areas like energy, renewable energy, solar power, oil and gas is enormous. Yesterday we heard the CEO of Tellurian talk about the potentials for oil and gas. Uh, the scope for investments in an area that covers a wide swath of, uh, of our economic requirements is, uh, is, a place, is an area where the United States is very well placed to, to be involved in. So what I'm trying to say is that the scope for investments and the potentials in a country like India today uh, is, is enormous and of course um, I think what is drawn out perhaps by Master Justice is the fact that we share the same values and principles. We are both democracies. We are the oldest democracy. We are the largest democracy. Uh, we, have, we believe in a rule of law. We believe in a free and vibrant media. We have an independent judiciary. So you have systems that are compatible. And so you will not have any, um, any uh, let's say, surprises as you go along in terms of investments. You know that there is a, a regime that is similar to yours that would provide a framework under which you would uh, make your investments. Um, you may not have that in, in all the places that you invest in. So uh, both the potentials for investments in terms of demand, as well as the framework that is around it, and, uh, and the, uh, I think, uh, intention of Prime Minister Modi to ensure that you have an environment that is conducive to those investments, I think is very important. And Ambassador Jesser. Well, I had mentioned a moment ago that the world is undergoing enormous change right now. I like to say the tectonic plates of the international order are shifting, and one of those elements is the rise of China, which is obviously going to be uh, influential throughout the world in terms of its global reach. But in the recent years, China has also become an increasingly difficult market for U.S. and other foreign companies who have found the type of laws and regime they operate under uh, increasingly oppressive. And so what you see is U.S. companies either not expanding their operations in China or in some cases, especially in the technology world, pulling out. This is an enormous strategic opportunity for India. These companies are going to go someplace else to establish their manufacturing bases and to put other countries embedded into the global supply chain. India, in my opinion, is a natural place because of its size, and you'd not only be serving the Indian market, but the regional and global market. But to do that, you have to have the right conditions to attract and retain investment. And I think there have been a lot of reforms over the years in India that have moved in that direction, but quite frankly, more needs to be done. We need to have a more predictable regulatory environment. We want to see investment grow, but when you're an investor, you look and see, and you do the numbers, how will this investment work over time? And you see what factors you have to mitigate. And if the regulatory environment is not predictable, that's a troublesome factor. And what you want is to attract investment to India and not for it to go to other countries in ASEAN, like Vietnam or Thailand or Indonesia, or even out of the region uh, entirely. You also have to ensure that while you have a rules-based system, the legal order operates efficiently and effectively in cases don't take quite as long as they might now. 
And I think you have to open up in terms of barriers to trade. Again, that's happened over the years. Obviously, there was a big opening in 1991, but we still see situations where companies don't establish operations in India because they cannot import some of the parts that go into their goods without high tariffs. So my own view is it's in India's interest to continue to open the economy and create the environment that will attract investment and trade and really make it a global hub for business and be fully integrated into the global supply chain. A quick question, Ambassador. The election of the new government in India, how will that affect Indo-US relations? Well, I think uh, it augurs very well for the relationship. Um, Prime Minister Modi has uh, uh, made a lot of efforts to take the relationship to new heights. Um, he has uh, personally uh, visited the United States uh, three times uh, since he is uh, taking power. And uh, he's established a good rapport with uh, President Trump. Uh, and clearly, the, we have uh, mechanisms and systems across the board that uh, provide for a relationship that could, uh, that could be more vibrant, more dynamic, and stronger. We have 53 bilateral mechanisms that uh, work on institutional cooperation in different areas. But all of this, of course, requires the political will and the push that is necessary. And that's where I think the re-election of Prime Minister Modi, not only his re-election, but the fact that he has a very clear and strong mandate uh, to uh, take uh, uh, our own uh, engagement with our principal partners forward, uh, um, very evident. So that, I think, is, is important. And we will see uh, a number of important decisions, uh, initiatives taken by the government uh, in the first 100 days of its term that would, uh, I think, um, be a, a great, uh, uh, I would say, um, boost uh, to the existing um, you know, economic and uh, commercial ties between our two countries. Um, Master Jester mentioned about the environment, uh, the framework, and I think a lot of those will be addressed in many of the initiatives that our government uh, will be taking uh, soon uh, within the first uh, few months of the second term of Prime Minister Modi's. Each of you uh, do a fair amount of, go ahead, Ambassador, if you'd like to make some observations on well, that. First of all, I, I mean, I, just to quickly add, uh, my congratulations to the Prime Minister. It's extraordinary to be in India when this election takes place. It goes over seven phases, over 600 million people vote. Uh, it's an extraordinary event, and the Prime Minister uh, worked tirelessly, and congratulations to him, to the new members of his cabinet, to the parliamentarians, and we wish them all the very best uh, in what they're going to be doing. Uh, I think it's a very positive uh, move for the U.S.-India relationship. There's an excellent rapport between the Prime Minister and President Trump. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, I think people should draw importance and significance to the fact that Secretary Pompeo was here yesterday speaking about the relationship and will be traveling out to India later this month, uh, very soon after the election, to meet with the Prime Minister, with the new external affairs minister, Jay Shankar, who has served as U.S. ambassador to India, who knows the United States well, and I think will obviously do things that make sense for India, but I think he sees the U.S.-India relationship as an important part of India's future. Uh, and so I think it's going to be a very positive development. We're looking forward to these engagements. Uh, we have later this summer some other in events. There's an India-U.S. forum that we'll have a lot of Americans at that we're looking forward to. So I'm very optimistic about uh, what the election of the prime minister means to the future of the relationship. The two of you have probably had the opportunity to hear more people opine on the issue of the bilateral relationship and all of your travels, all of your feedback, uh, you know, the convergent interests. Uh, what, what have you heard, Ambassador Shringla, as, as in terms of your uh, uh, in engagement across the United States? Uh, give us maybe a little bit of the, of the flavor of the feedback and how things are perceived. Well, uh, it's been five months since I've arrived here and uh, a lot of our work is in Washington, but I've also realized that you need to go out and engage the states, and uh, a lot of real work is, is uh, you know, in your engagement with individual states that have an interest in trade and economic relations with India. And in that context, we're very happy that we work closely with the USIBC, uh, 
uh, President of uh, President Nisha Biswa, in uh, reaching out to several states. We've visited, uh, besides the fact of, that I've visited all the major cities, but we've also visited uh, states like Kentucky. Governor Bevin was here yesterday. He's a great supporter of the relationship. He wants to encourage uh, Indian companies to invest in Kentucky and companies headquartered in Kentucky to go out and look at India as an investment destination. Uh, we had some good interactions there. We've gone to Los Angeles, gone to Texas. Uh, so um, a fair amount of traveling in the first few months, but it also gave me a sense of how people think and what they, uh, you know, how they look at the relationship. And my sense is that we've come a very long way in the last couple of decades. And I was here in the United States uh, in, in, in the turn of the century, I mean, around 2002. Uh, and at that time, of course, there was a great deal of optimism. Uh, there was already a sense that India was a country that was associated with uh, high technology, professionals, the IT sector. But today, I think it is that image is much more, much more reinforced. And uh, the success of the relationship in terms of taking it to the heights that we now see it, uh, the very strong and positive strategic ties and relationship that we have developed, um, and uh, much of it, as I said, comes from making those seminal changes in, 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 in the first uh, decade of, this, uh, of the 21st century. But also the fact that uh, people see um, in India as an important partner, not just in, in, in uh, strategic terms, but in e economic and uh, commercial terms, I think is also a factor. And a strong uh, Indian American community that has been successful uh, in their professions, uh, in their entrepreneurship uh, efforts in the United States has also helped in creating uh, that image of India as uh, an Indians, uh, as uh, a positive, uh, uh, let's say, force in uh, the development of uh, U.S.'s uh, external relationships. And uh, so uh, wherever I went, we, f we found a, a great deal of interest. Uh, there was great receptivity uh, to the relationship wherever you were. And also, I think, uh, a, a very, very keen desire to see how we could uh, further enhance that relationship. And, uh, and I think that uh, cuts across the board, uh, whether it is uh, in Washington or New York or whether it is in uh, towns and cities that are not that well known um, internationally. And Ambassador Jester, you're, yeah. you're the I, feedback I, you received. Absolutely. I, I, I like to say it's a great privilege to be a U.S. ambassador, but it's a very special privilege to be the ambassador to India because wherever I travel, and I've traveled extensively in the country, myself as the representative of the United States is treated incredibly well and met with enormous friendship and respect and a desire to engage. Uh, the key, one of the keys of the U.S.-India relationship that I think distinguishes it from most others is the people-to-people -people connection that we have. And it's grown exponentially to the point you now have four million Indian Americans in the United States contributing enormously to our economy. But you have tremendous American investment in India. Throughout different states, they want more investment, more U.S. technology, more educational opportunities, more training. Many of the leaders I meet at the state level, the chief ministers, say their greatest and most important investment is in the United States. And I say, and what is that? My children. Uh, and that really tells you about the ties between our country. But I have met nothing but positive sentiment toward the relationship. And I think that's really one of the great foundations for why this is going to be one of the most meaningful relationships of the 21st century. So the defense relationship is growing. And there's a growing con concern also about the theft uh, of sensitive technology. So there's this competition for creating safe manufacturing hubs. India is obviously well positioned here. What steps, what steps is India taking to make it an attractive place to manufacture sensitive defense technology and to integrate it into the global uh, supply chain? Well, uh, to put it in context, you have to look at uh, the fact that uh, both, the, both India and the United States uh, see a common vision of the Indo-Pacific as open, transparent, free, and inclusive uh, areas in line with our own values and principles. Um, we've come a very long way in a, in a very short while in taking the defense relationship forward. I think uh, it is not more than 15 to 20 years, really can be traced back to 2008 when the Indo-US Civil Nuclear Agreement was signed. 
And since then, I think we have uh, really um, gone on to having our largest uh, military exercises with the United States. Today, uh, you are our largest partner in terms of uh, the joint exercises we conduct. This year, we will have trilateral exercises involving all three services. Uh, and it is focused on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, which is a very important area of uh, engagement with many of our partners and interlocutors in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, and this also translates into a relationship in which uh, we are today um, sourcing about eight, $18 billion of our defense equipment and technology requirements from the United States. And as our requirements go, because we live in a dynamic security environment, our defense requirements are likely to increase. At this point of time, we spend 1.8% of our GDP on defense, which in comparative terms, and looking at our neighborhood, is relatively uh, small. Uh, we are likely to spend more on defense. We're talking about five to $10 billion a year on defense requirements. And there is a greater imperative as we do that uh, to try and uh, create an indigenous uh, defense equipment and technology environment. There have been great policy changes in the environment. We've allowed foreign direct investments uh, in 100% of our defense sector, uh, which means that uh, foreign investors come, and come in and invest in our defense sector. We've created an enabling environment for that to happen. And uh, we are looking to see how we could take our uh, uh, OEMs in, from a, a, let us say, buyer-seller relationship to a co-developer, co-manufacturer relationship. And uh, this is in line with the Prime Minister's Make in India initiative. And uh, I think we are seeing far greater interest in, that, uh, in those efforts uh, from US companies. We see a partnership that goes into joint R&D, joint production, joint uh, development, and of course, uh, production of uh, defense equipment and technologies. And so uh, the potentials are enormous. I think we will be seeing a lot more in that area. Uh, but having talked about defense, I just want to bring back a point that Master Jester made about the fact that when we look at defense and security in strategic terms, I think it is time that we also looked at trade and economic relations in strategic terms. We cannot isolate the two. It's important that the relationship on the whole be considered a strategic relationship and one that is given the same focus as defense and uh, security because the, the two are interlinked and they cannot be separated. And so as we go along to de develop that defense relationship and uh, take a very active partnership, and one more important thing is that we're increasing our interoperability as well as the communications uh, that is possible between armed forces. With the signing of the BECA and, the, and now with the considering of the Industrial Security Annex, India would become a far, uh, you know, at least institutionally, we have all the foundational agreements in place that would enable US companies to both produce, manufacture, and do research in India. And keep in mind that over 400 of the 500, Fortune 500 companies are conducting the R&D in India, which means that they have invested in developing uh, cutting-edge technologies in India. They consider those technologies safe in India. So clearly, it is an environment that has both the IPR regime necessary, the safeguard necessary, the institutional frameworks, and of course, uh, you know, the value systems in terms of the overarching uh, judiciary and other factors that are in place that would be conducive for US uh, defense uh, companies, both in terms of equipment and technology, to look at India as a manufacturing hub. Not just for India, but again, I speak both for Bangladesh, Thailand, and countries around us, that the market and the potentials are enormous in India and beyond us. And uh, in wrapping up, Ambassador Justin, Very your quickly, thoughts on this? I think a lot of the points were mentioned. Defense co-production is another enormous area of opportunity. We do a certain amount of that right now. I think we can do more. As the ambassador said, we have to conclude the remaining enabling agreements. We've got Comcasa signed last year. We have the BECA and the Industrial Security Agreement. We also have to, again, make sure that the conditions are such, whether it's through intellectual property right protection, low tariff rates, that parts can come in for this manufacturing and can be part of the global supply chain. Uh, that we have the conditions that are conducive. And I, the, the other issue that I know is of concern to U.S. companies at times is that the offset program not be too oppressive and that there be credit given properly for offsets so that it can be done in a compatible way that makes sense for both partners to be continuing to produce in India and to be building up India's indigenous defense capabilities. Well, thank you, Ambassador Juster. Thank we you. appreciate this very, appreciate much. very much. Ambassador Shrinla, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.